Okay, uh, so we're all good to, you can hear me? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, thanks everybody for joining me this evening. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about wool from my experience um, and answer any questions that you have or attempt to answer any questions that you have. Um, and yeah, we'll just get started. So, uh, let me see. Oh. Okay. There we go. My screen was frozen up a bit. But uh, we're just going to quickly, I'll touch a little bit about custom woolen mills and the type of processing we do so that everybody is familiar with. Um, the stages of wool processing, at least in the context of our business. Um, you've already introduced me, so I'll skip over that. Um, and then we're going to cover quickly wool types and how they relate to different sheep breeds. I think that's a really important thing to understand when you're talking about wool um, and to be able to understand about your own flock. Um, then we're going to talk about on-farm strategies for maximizing your wool value, no matter what type of wool you've got. Um, preparing your wool for processing or sale. And then I'll just cover some challenges and opportunities in the Canadian wool market. And if there's time, we'll touch on um, kind of marketing strategies for smaller and then larger scale producers. Huh. So, um, as you may or may not be aware, wool has been kind of part of the human textile experience since prior to recorded history. Um, and that is because wool is a really incredible fiber. It's very insulative. And so, um, and it handles moisture really well. It's fire resistant. Um, and it's quick and easy to work with. So you shear it off the sheep and immediately you can start processing it into a wearable textile, um, which is very unique compared to most other um, fibers that we get our textiles from. Uh, for some, wool is a very inconvenient byproduct of lamb production, or for most, um, most folks here in Alberta, I would say that's where it fits in. Um, but for others, wool is the whole name of the game and their entire flock is raised up around um, growing a, a wool product. But in either instance, there are certainly are steps that you can take to maximize its value potential. Um, and in all instances, good quality wool products start at the farm. That's, yeah. So about custom one mills, uh, we got started out here east of Carstairs, Alberta in approximately 1975. My parents started it up and um, it's the amalgamation of two historical woolen mills that were put together. Um, one that was from Sifton, Manitoba and one that was from McGrath, Alberta. And at the time that they purchased the equipment um, and brought it to its location now, those mills were shutting down. Um, they and the equipment was basically going to go for scrap metal because the synthetic textile industry was so huge and wool was very much not a popular fiber um, in terms of as far as consumers were considered. Uh, so at the mill, the first step that we take is uh, hand sorting the fleeces and putting them through a wash system. So someone stands um, all day and goes through just grabbing the leftover bits that didn't get caught at skirting. So basically taking an, a look at the grade of the fiber, making sure it's consistent for whatever product we're washing for, and then taking out last bits of vegetation or any digs that were missed. Um, but as you can see, we're mostly looking for pretty clean uniform clips. Um, yeah. 
then next in the process after it's washed. So on our system, it goes to a duster, which rips the fibers into smaller um, locks. And then it blows up through a tube and into a wash tank. And so we have one big tank that is full of hot soapy water. And then we have a rinse tank, which is just water to rinse out that soap. And then we spin it and rinse it one last time before tumble drying it. Um, so we don't do any uh, carbonizing or anything to burn out vegetation that way. So we have what would be considered a minimal processing system. And so we always need to start with extremely clean wool in order to make that work properly. Once it's washed and dried, then we card it, which um, is basically brushing the fiber. That's this middle picture here. So all of these rolls have metal wire brushing material on them. And as the fiber feeds through, the rolls organize the fibers. It goes starts very coarse at the back of the machine. And then by the time it comes to the front, um, the fibers have been organized quite a bit and they are layered out in a very fine um, fiber web. Our system is called a woolen processing system. Um, and that is different from a worsted processing system. So a woolen processing system is brushes. A worsted processing system has the additional of combs. So after the fibers are brushed, they get run through a set of combs and that aligns all the fibers in one direction. And so worsted processing systems can sometimes handle a little bit more vegetation in the fiber because the combs will comb out some of that vegetation. Um, but woolen processing systems have to start with fiber that's quite free of vegetation. And to my knowledge, there aren't really any um, small or large industrial worsted systems in Canada that work with Canadian wool. Um, I could be wrong, but I'm, I don't think so. Um, after carding, once this fiber web is created, you can either have a finished product, like here we're making quilting bats, um, and we also roll this fiber web up to make rovings, but we can also split it. So take um, quick or take strands of it and split it into strands of yarn. And from there, um, it basically ends up on a roll, which you'll see up on this picture here. So that's a roll of carded fiber. From there, we can spin it. So the strands are drawn out and twisted, and the twist gives the wool strength. Um, and that is the beginning of a finished yarn. Um, and we have a few other spinning systems at our mill to make plied yarns. So the more uh, strands of yarn you twist together, the stronger the yarn's gonna be, similar to rope. Um, yeah. From spinning, so that's basically at our mill a finished product. Or um, So we sell a lot of hand working yarns for knitting and crocheting um, and other crafts. Uh, but we also do some consumer finished products like wool filled bedding. So down here, we're, we've got a quilting machine um, that we take these bats from the carding machine and put them between cotton and quilt it into comforters, mattress pads, sleeping bags, and pillows. And we also have circular sock knitting machines at our mill, um, which, uh, so we take the finished yarn and make machine knit socks. So that's just a quick overview of the mill. Um, and just for context, we are purchasing and processing around between 60 and 70,000 pounds of wool a year in our own wholesale and retail product line. And then we are probably processing around 30,000 pounds a year for custom processing. Um, so yeah, this is a slide about me. And uh, we'll get into looking at wool types and sheep breeds. 
Um, I really think it's very important for any wool or sheep producer to understand what type of wool your sheep are growing. Um, it, that's the first question I ask anyone that contacts me about if they want to sell wool or they want to get their wool custom processed. You really need to know what you're starting with. Um, and even not just in terms of processing the wool, but um, you know, listening to John Beasley's uh, presentation a couple of weeks ago about shearing, I didn't even realize the extent to which um, you know, the wool characteristics that your breed has impact when it's appropriate to shear your sheep um, and how they're gonna do with different lambing conditions and housing conditions throughout the year. So you really need to know what type of wool um, you've got and how that relates. And so that relates to the sheep breeds that you're growing. Um, at the mill, we classify wool according to basically five or six different types um, or five types that we use at the mill. And then the sixth type would be like coarse wool that we just don't deal with at our mill. Um, so those types are fine type, um, domestic medium type, down type, long wool type, and then specialty type. And I'll get into the specifics of each of those in a moment. But I do want to just point out as well that there is a fiber called Kemp, which is basically a hair that grows up through some wool fleeces. And it's particularly common in certain breeds. Um, and you should always be on the lookout for Kemp in your fleeces um, and hairy britches, which is like when your animals, you really start to notice it sometimes as they age and their hind britch gets really hairy instead of having the characteristics of wool. And when you notice that no matter what breed you're growing, um, if you've got animals that have a lot of Kemp or hairy britches, if all things else are equal in terms of lamb production, um, you should remove those animals from your genetic line because they, the occurrence of Kemp and hairy britches are always gonna devalue your wool. So what is Kemp? So I've got a picture here. This is kind of, there is some Kemp in here and this is also from a really hairy part of a fleece on the leg looking more like human hair or whiskers than wool. Um, then in here, these black fibers are Kemp fibers that would have come from a white fleece um, and they are in someone's pillow. And so the Kemp actually works up through fabric um, and is like, it's like getting a whisker in your soft like a really hard whisker in your soft wool. Um, so as you can imagine, this is not an enjoyable experience for someone who's got a wool filled pillow to have these black whiskery fibers show up. They actually thought they were human hairs, which they are not. They are from, um, yeah, they're like coarse hairs growing up through the fleece. And then in this yarn over here, you can see these white whiskery fibers and that is Kemp. So Kemp is like a whisker. It doesn't take any dye and it is very brittle. It doesn't spin. It doesn't grab onto the other fibers the way wool does. And so as you can see that there's, you know, someone isn't very happy about having white whiskery fibers show up in their blue, um, blue hand spun yarn. Um, so that's what you got to look out for in terms of Kemp and Harry Bridges. Okay, so the types. 
So fine type uh, wool is normally classed as anything under 25 microns or less. Um, I was looking at the CCWG website and they've got theirs listed as 27 microns or less. Um, that's a pretty specific, like nobody has a micronometer that they're looking at to figure that out. At the mill, we do it by feel. Um, but a fine type wool is typically very tightly packed in the fleece. So there are many follicles per, cent per square centimeter um, in the fleece. It has a very uniform crimp and it tends to be in on the shorter side. Uh, most of those breeds are growing wool in the two to four inch range. It has a matte finish normally. So that's a duller finish. And these are uh, breeds that tend to have a lot of grease in the fleece, so a lot of lanolin. Um, and so the fine types are your Rambolets, Merinos, uh, Targhees tend to be in the fine area, and finer Corydale um, fleeces. I would classify all those in the fine type of wool. And fine wool is excellent for use in next to the skin garments where softness is a must. Um, we also use them to give more substance to coarser uh, fiber yarns just to help it through the machinery because um, in a fine wool, you have many fibers per inch. Um, and so all those fibers hooking together really gives, um, gives strength and elasticity um, in terms of running through machinery. They, oops, sorry. They also wet felt easily. And wet felting is basically intentionally shrinking wool with um, water and agitation. Some of the challenges with fine type wool is that um, it's harder to keep your raw fleece clean. Like you can, stuff can really get embedded in those fleeces um, and they're less durable than coarse wools because each individual fiber is finer and more fragile. So fine wools are more prone to pilling um, in finished garments and products. The next type um, that we're gonna talk about is what just generally we class as domestic medium type. Um, some examples of those breeds are the Dorsets. Um, we class Ile de France in the domestic medium. Rideau Arcot is a pretty common one these days. These wool, wools are in the range of 26 to 30 or 33 microns. They are typically looser in the fleece um, with less grease and they typically have a slightly longer staple length in the three to four inch range with one year's growth. Um, and they often have some luster, so a little bit more of a glossy finish than the fine wools. Uh, and a nice thing about the domestic medium wools is that they're a nice trade-off between strength and softness. So because they're a little less fine, they're a little less prone to pilling, um, which makes them excellent for outerwear garments, like heavier sweaters. Um, we put domestic medium type wool toward anything that's gonna be used in saddle pads um, or saddle blankets. Uh, and they can be okay for rugs, um, particularly decorative rugs. Um, and they're also good for applications, processing applications where there's gonna be a lot more mechanical friction or craft applications where there's more mechanical friction. So domestic medium is excellent for needle felting. Oh man, sorry about this. I am messing about. Um, yeah, domestic medium is good for needle felting, which is basically using a barbed needle to create that shrinking process. They tend to have more luster and luster takes up dye really nicely. Um, they're not as nice for next to the skin uh, garments. Okay, the next type we're gonna talk about is down type wools. Um, and the down part refers to kind of a type of breed that 
it's from the UK. It doesn't refer to downy fiber, like the down of a, of a bird or something like that. It's not necessarily softer. So wool from the down breeds, um, these are your Suffolk, uh, Hampshire's, Canadian Arcot, we class as a down type because it's got a lot of Suffolk in the background genetics. Um, and the down breeds typically are black faced sheep with white uh, fleeces. And the reason that is important to note is that the because of the black faced background, almost always the white fleece has a gray undertone to it. So there's always slight gray, gray fibers um, in the fleece. And that impacts the way you want to sort those fleeces and the way they'll get graded internationally. Um, the wool characteristics tend to be really spongy. It's got a confused crimp, so um, a lot of loft and bounce. And um, because of this, the, the fibers don't felt very easily and they don't mat down. Um, so we preferentially use down type wools for anything that has bedding um, or upholstery stuffing type applications or any other products where you want a lot of loft. Um, but it's not great for next to the skin yarns. And because of that gray undertone, it's not good for white yarns and it's not great for dyeing because depending on the level of gray that comes through, it can change your dye from lot to lot. So that's why um, I know we a lot of people like people just call it black wool, um, which is not. It's white wool with a, for with from black faced sheep, but uh, it's because internationally it's always going to get graded together, and it's going to end up going to something um, that the color isn't as big a deal. Next, we've got long wool types. That's your Romneys, Cotswold, uh, Lester's. These wools are typically four inches or longer, and they're usually quite coarse, um, starting around 30 microns and above. They tend to have not very much crimp in the lock, but rather curls. So you can see here, this is a very curly sheep. Um, and in this fleece down here, you can see long locks with nice, beautiful curls. They have lots of luster. So when they've got lots of shine and when you dye them, that dyed fiber also has nice shine. And they are heavier and tend to drape heavily in finished garments. Um, that means they, because of that strength, the length, the coarser fiber. They are excellent in high wear applications like slippers and rugs, um, but they're also a favorite of hand spinners and crafters because of the way they take dye um, and because they have a lot of character, like lots of people use them as embellishment and in their, in their fiber art pieces. Um, they're not great necessarily for next to the skin garments because they can be a bit itchier, because of the coarseness and they are not appropriate really for uh, wool filled bedding or upholstery unless you're using a really thick fabric because the long silky shiny fibers are prone to creeping up and migrating through fabric and they also pack down a lot so they don't maintain their loft. If you are going to have a long wool processed at a mill most of the time, it can't be longer than five inches. So uh, you really got to pay attention to how long your fleeces are getting. Um, the five, for us in, in particular, but this is something that impacts many, many mills um, or woolen mills. Um, basically, five inches is the diameter of our smallest rolls that the wool has to move through. And if the wool is longer than that five inches, then rather than transferring from roll to roll, it just wraps all the way around. So 
basically then we end up having to cut it out of our machine and that's where it stops. Then the last category is specialty type wool. And this is a huge catch-all category for anything that um, doesn't fit into the above categories. Um, these tend to be uh, wools that are from rarer breeds. Um, they often have double coats. So that's a fine undercoat and a coarse guard hair that grows together. So, um, and they sometimes grow their wool very quickly. So they sometimes require shearing twice per year rather than once. Um, some examples of the double coat breed is the Icelandic and the Romanoff um, breeds. I've got thin sheep here in the specialty type because, not because it's double coated, but because it's got a lot of luster. Um, the wool characteristics are more similar to a long wool, but then it also can be incredibly fine. So with the specialty type breeds, you really just have to assess them on a case by case basis. Um, for what their wool is going to be appropriate for. Uh, they are often sought after by hand spinners and crafters because they like to try all kinds of different things. But the specialty breeds in terms of the wool market are also subject to trends in the crafting market. So one year Gotland wool will be the most popular thing. And then the next year, nobody's interested really in doing much with it. Down here, I have an example of some Icelandic fleece. So over here, this is the full lock that I've taken out of the fleece. And then I just pulled by hand the guard hair and the fine um, under hair out. So you can see this all came from the same lock. It's pretty interesting, but these guard hairs can be pretty pokey if you spin them into yarn. So you gotta be careful what product you're making with it. I just want to um, make a note about colored wool. So this is natural grays, blacks, browns. Um, international wool market, it's been considered a low quality product and most, um, most people seek to remove any colored wool from their breed or from their flock. And that's because um, the wool market is geared towards large mills that are basically going to dye all their product and they want to dye it onto white wool because you can have a more consistent um, dyeing process that way. Um, but colored wool is sought after in the craft market and definitely in the Canadian domestic market. So um, and at custom wool mills we value colored wool on par with or above white wool of the same type. We are always at a shortage of colored wool and we are always competing with the other mills here in Canada to get our hands on some colored wool. Um, so we don't discriminate against colored wool. And then I just wanted to, now that we've talked about the different types, um, make a note about crossbreeding. I, if you want to see value in your wool, it's really important when you're crossbreeding to consider if the wool characteristics of the two of the breeds you're crossing complement each other or diminish each other. Because um, it's not just that if you breed to a finer sheep breed, you're gonna have higher quality wool. It really depends on the crosses that you're making. So for example, for example, when you crossbreed of Romneys and Rambouillets, um, the Romney is a long wool type, the Rambouillet is a fine wool type. Um, the Romney tends to introduce some length back into the Rambouillet fleece, and it doesn't tend to degrade the fineness too much. Um, very quickly uh, in the genetics. So it's a pretty good cross to make. Um, on the opposite side of that, if you cross this, a Suffolk breed with a Rambouillet breed, 
um, both wool types are compromised because the, the whole, like the good thing about the Suffolk breed is that um, it is resistant to felting, it's coarser, it has a lot of loft. Um, and the good thing about a Rambouillet breed is that it's very fine and it's soft and it easily felts. Um, so if you, the Rambouillet Suffolk cross um, makes it so that the Suffolk isn't very good wool or it can't be used in the down wool type because the fine aspect of it makes it so that it's likely to mat in a, in a bedding situation um, or creep through fabric. And you can't use that wool as a Rambouillet type because it's contaminated with uh, black fibers from the Suffolk background. Um, so I think this is a cross where in terms of wool, both categories are kind of compromised. So depending on where you're at um, in your lamb production program, if wool is something that interests you, you should definitely be looking at how, um, like when you're introducing new genetics to improve meat production or improve um, like milk production or whatever it is that you're trying to improve, you want to think about the wool characteristics and which breeds are, can you choose from that are going to improve the value of your wool and which breeds are going to diminish it. So now that you know what type of wool you're growing um, and no matter what type of wool you're growing to maximize its value, there are really three key areas that you need to pay attention to. Your wool needs to be clean, it needs to be carefully sorted, and it needs to be properly stored. And this requires kind of a whole system view of your operation and attention to detail right from the start of the year and ideally when you're first starting up getting into sheep. Um, once you have a plan in place, it becomes easier and easier to execute, I think, and, um, and easier to make improvements on. So clean wool. Uh, when someone calls me up after I've asked them what type of sheep do they have, um, the next thing I'm gonna ask is what kind of feeding system do you have? Uh, you, if your wool is gonna be usable for anything, you wanna make sure to themselves that Contamination of fleeces with vegetative matter is something that you just really can't come back from in processing. And it's definitely one of the biggest barriers the Canadian wool clip has to seeing more value. Um, and yeah, so round bale feeders are a really bad one in terms of keeping your wool clean. Anything you can do to have them you know, eating low to the ground. So here they've got a bunk system set up where the sheep are reaching through the fence. And down here, they got a bunk system set up where they actually fill the bunks. Uh, they got the sheep penned back here overnight and they fill the bunks and let them out to it. So they've got a big stampede happening, but this keeps the wool pretty clean. Um, yeah, so feeding, is a big one there. Next one is your holding areas. You need your corrals to be clean and dry. Um, in terms of bedding, long bedded, so shredded straw or shavings, that's just like the fines in the hay. Again, get some bedded into the fleece and then there's no really coming back from that. Um, anything you can do to work to remove burrs and brambles from your grazing areas. So strategically grazing the plants when you can knock them back and not have that in your fleeces. Um, burrs and vegetative matter from hay, like the fines from hay are probably the worst for contamination in fleeces. Uh, fleece marking is another one 
that is no good. I know the marking pens are marketed as washable, like there's wool washable pens, but that's false. It just, it doesn't wash out the, you know, and I think in the cases where they're applied properly um, from, I can't remember what the distance is that you're supposed to spray if it's three feet or something like that. Um, it can wash out in a really big industrial system potentially, but generally it doesn't. So paint marker on fleeces, you need to put it strategically where you can skirt it away um, as best you can. So on the neck or the top of the head, where you're probably going to be skirting that away anyway because it'll be filled with vegetative matter from like so if you can put your uh, fleece marker up there as well um, that makes it pretty easy to squirt skirt away uh, when you're doing your shearing and this is a thing that all around the world uh, wool boards advise producers about that the wool washable paint markers are not washable. They don't come out. And then lastly, the place that we see a lot of contamination in the fleeces, um, it actually is happening at shearing. So it seems like the wool came through the year nice and clean. The feeding setup is good. Um, but then at shearing, the fleeces all got put down on straw and the straw like the fleece opens up because it's just been showing off it sat down on the straw and you grab it up and it grabs all that straw with it and goes into the bag and you can't get it back out um so the fourth place in the year where you really got to make sure you're keeping your fleeces clean is just at shearing Make sure you have a clean, sweepable area for your shears to work on. And that's not just to keep the fleeces clean, but as John Beasley was saying, that's to keep the shears safe. Um, you don't want them slipping on manure and stuff. Um, so you put a piece of plywood down and have someone in charge of making sure to clean it up when it gets soiled. Um, and you'll keep your wool clean and you'll keep your shears in good shape. And then a skirting table to put the fleece down on. And that can really be anything. It can be a piece of um, expanded metal if you want to get fancy, but it can just be a table that you put out that you can throw your fleece down on, take a quick look at it, remove the contaminated parts, and then put it in the bag. You want to make sure at shearing that you're not getting um, barnyard contaminants like baler twine in with your fleece. Um, we had a piece of baler twine go through our milling system earlier this year. It just got missed when we were hand sorting into the wash system. Ended up back in our carding system. And it was a strand of baler twine. And I ended up running about 100 pounds of wool through our system before the synthetic fiber was out of it. And it was amazing how noticeable this little piece of blue curly synthetic fiber was in our yarn. It splits down to the most um, tiny piece that is just stuck there. So baler twine is a major contaminant that any mill will have trouble with and that'll grade your fiber down big time if it's in there. Uh, so carefully sorted wool and this is something that just you have to be set up to do at shearing. The fastest most economical place to sort wool is right as it comes off the sheep. Once it's been compressed and put into a bale, it's very slow to resort it and regrade it. Um, it. Like the fleeces don't uncompress the same way. Um, so to sort your wool, 
if you have multiple breeds and you have black faced sheep and white faced sheep in there, you either want to sort your sheep prior to shearing or sort your wool according to what sheep they're coming off of. Um, if you mix your black faced wool in with your white faced wool, um, it'll always get graded down to the lowest common denominator um, if it's going to CCWG or internationally. Um, you basically want to make sure that you're keeping your nicest wool separate um, so that you can at least capitalize on that. Uh, so share your white faced sheep first to avoid contamination of white wool with dark fibers. Um, skirt your fleeces. So that's removing the dags, which are the manure covered bits um, on the back end of the sheep, the short belly fibers. Um, you want to rip off, let's just see. Yeah, you want to rip off the veg, vegetation filled necks and any um, paint markings that might be there. And you want to rip off the hairiest bits of those legs, the hairy britches that I was showing you earlier. So this fleece here has been expertly uh, skirted. There, you can see there's nothing in terms of manure back here on the back end and nothing in terms of chaff here on the front end. And then you want to compost your off skirts. I know that um, lots of people take their belly wool to CCWG and get 10 cents a pound for it or whatever. But I really think your skirted wool, um, your off skirts should just go directly into your compost pile. I don't think it makes sense to be storing what is mostly manure and vegetative matter and then driving it down to Lethbridge or wherever and then having them ship it to Ottawa um, for grading. So what you rip off the fleece, just put in your compost pile. Um, I just want to quickly go over the economics of wool sorting because it does make a difference kind of. I know that lots of people are not too pleased with the wool prices um, these days and that's an ongoing problem, but uh, it still is worth taking a look at. So like I said, the fastest, most economical place to sort and skirt wool is at shearing before the fleece has been compressed. And when wool arrives unsorted to a mill or a wool warehouse, you've basically immediately lost any value that there could ever be in it, just in the labor required to sort through those compressed fleeces. So just as an example, this is looking at um, the current prices for domestic medium wool sorted for the international market and sold through CCWG. Um, I spoke with them on the phone earlier this week just to share up some of these numbers, but um, so this is an example of, where is my marker? 500 sheep uh, estimating about six pounds per fleece not sorted. So that's about 3000 pounds of wool not sorted that you can take in to Lethbridge and they'll give you 10 cents a pound right off the bat. So that's 300 bucks. Um, if you sort it, for white wool and colored wool so that they are paying a premium um, or like a slightly higher advance for colored wool. So if you have 2,500 pounds of white wool, 500 pounds of colored wool, and you keep those two things separate, you're gonna get an extra $100 by putting in that effort. Um, and then if you do a careful job to make sure your wool is clean, well skirted and sorted um, when you take it in. I estimate that you'd end up with about 500 pounds of bellies and necks, um, which you'll get 10 cents a pound for. And then uh, 2,125 pounds of white wool and 375 pounds of black wool, which you'll get the premium on. So just with that extra effort, um, you're up a bit. I know it 
is hard to decide if the effort is worth it. Um, but the situation is definitely never going to get better if we don't have clean wool going through the um, CCWG into the international market. This is just a quick look at how things go here at Custom Woolen Mills. Um, so clean, well-skirted wool is gonna automatically lose about 40 to 60% of its weight with initial washing. So that's just washing out the lanolin, um, the grime and manure that's on the fleeces naturally, even on the cleanest one. So for every $1 spent on raw wool, it's equivalent to $2 for that clean wool. And that doesn't count any labor or power or heat that's gone into um, getting that clean wool. Um, so as you can imagine, unsorted, poorly skirted wool, if it comes in and we get 20% return on it, that's gonna, it automatically loses our mill money. And this year, there are actually two instances where um, I actually just took some wool to the dump because it was faster for us to get rid of it. Like it was more economical for us to get rid of it that way than to try to skirt through it. It was such a mess. Um, and that's an unfortunate situation that doesn't happen very often, uh, it, but yeah. So that same 500 sheep at six pounds per fleece, not sorted, a mill here in Canada is just not gonna buy it. I don't think. Um, we're certainly not gonna buy it twice if they buy it once. We don't buy any unsorted fleeces um, here. Uh, if you take the effort to sort it by white and colored, because we're so desperate for colored wool all the time, we'll probably agree to buy your colored wool at a dollar a pound. But if it's not clean and well sorted, sorted as well, um, that'll be a one-time sale. It'll be the one time we took a chance on it. If you have consistently a clean, well-skirted and well-sorted um, clip, then that means that you've sorted about 500 pounds of bellies and necks out, and we're not gonna buy that from you. Um, that should go on the compost pile, but that leaves you with 2,125 pounds of white wool, and 375 pounds of black wool that will pay you a premium at. Um, this is for domestic medium type wool. Um, and so here we're over $3,000 for that clip. And I think that starts to make sense in terms of putting in the F extra effort because there you're probably covering um, at least your shearing costs for that flock of 500 sheep. Okay, once you've got your wool clean and properly sorted, then it's you need to properly store it. So wool must always be stored dry. That's an absolute must. It, it ha the sheep have to be dry when they're shorn and the wool has to stay dry from that time forward. Uh, so that means that, um, yeah. It goes into the bag dry. It needs to be able to breathe. So you store it in burlap or paper when possible. You can certainly store it loosely in plastic bags if it's gonna be processed in about a year. There's no damage really that happens to it if it went into the bag dry. I never recommend storing raw wool in vacuum packed bags for longer than a month or so because wool holds a lot of moisture no matter, so whatever the environment is, even if it was dry, if it was, if the humidity level was at 30% or 40% that day, the wool's definitely got it. You put it in a vacuum packed bag, raw, it's a, just an environment for fungus um, and bacteria to grow. And I've seen like bright pink and bright orange fleeces come out of back, vacuum packed bags because of the bacteria and fungus growing in them. And they looked like they were nice fleeces that went in there, but uh, it just becomes an anaerobic environment and it just starts to rot. So I recommend people avoid the vacuum packed bags 
unless you're just putting them in there for shipping and then once they get to us, we're gonna take them out of those bags. Um, you need to store it under cover and up off the ground. Wool sacks and wool burlap or like wool squares are not waterproof. Um, so if wool is, if it's stored on the ground, um, it'll wick up the moisture out of the ground and it'll hold that water. And it'll basically mean that it's gonna go to the compost pile um, once it starts to rot there. So put it down on pallets when you can and under cover if you're gonna store it. And then my last suggestion would be really don't store your wool. If you don't have a plan for it and you don't have a market that you feel is valuable for you to access, um, then it's not going to gain in value the longer you store it. It's gonna it risk being contaminated with wool moths and vermin like mice. Um, it's gonna take up space and uh, it's not gonna be a good thing years down the road. So I would actually recommend if you don't have a plan for it, look into composting it. Wool compost is an excellent source of slow release nitrogen. It's got a full complement of nutrients, um, a well-managed pile. So lots of complementary manure and straw and you're turning it over. Um, the wool will go away in about six months. If you aren't managing a compost pile very much then it takes about two years for the wool to turn over. Um, but it's an excellent, excellent um, compost material. I would caution people against burning your wool. If you don't have a market for it, wool is naturally fire resistant. And um, what, so it's, it's historically been made into fire blankets for that reason. Um, and so burning, trying to burn a wool pile is kind of a whole level of misery that I don't think you should attempt. Um, and I do think there is an emerging market in wool garden pellets. I've heard of quite a few pellet machines that have come into Alberta. Um, and I think that's a pretty excellent thing um, as an option for wool that you, you don't have a market for. Uh, preparing wool for processing or sale. Um, few things here. If you're going to send it to a mill, you need to contact the mill ahead of time just to make sure you know what you're doing with it. Mills are not storage facilities, so if you don't have a plan for your wool, don't plan on sending it to the mill. Um, but uh, So contact whatever mill you're going to send it to ahead of time and make arrangements, um, but then when you do send it, Make sure you have your name, your contact information, including a phone number, the type of wool that you're sending, um, your lot or product, in, product instructions, the amount of fiber in the lot, and the total amount in the shipment. So here we've got Lou Farms, John Smart sending in some wool. He's got his address, a phone number, the type of wool that he's sending is Targi, uh, the lot, it's going to be processed into a white two-ply yarn. And in this lot, it's this labels in bag three of six in this lot out of a total shipment of 23 bags for Blue Farms. Um, if you're a producer and you're selling wool uh, here, the bare minimum, you need to have the type of wool that you've got and your name, your farm name, and your contact information. Um, carefully sorted and labeled wool is always easier and more economical to handle, um, which means better pricing, whether that's if you're selling it through CCWG, the faster they can get it through their grading system, the more economical their system's gonna be. And if it's coming to our mill or another mill to process, um, the faster it can these kind of administration things don't need to be dealt with, the better off everybody is in terms of um, 
the economic viability of small mills. Uh, so now I'll just briefly touch on some challenges and opportunities in the Canadian market. Um, there are definitely some big challenges, which a lot of people have been thinking about um, and perhaps talking about more, but these are not new challenges. They've been ongoing. So one big challenge is that it's just a fact more sheep meat is consumed in the world than wool is used in textiles. So there is definitely a higher supply of wool um, than the market is using. Uh, COVID-19 with um, basically decrease in shopping and spending that way has really hit the international wool market. Um, and so market prices for wool have dropped around the world. It's not just a Canadian problem. Um, it's been something that's impacted UK wool farmers um, and New Zealand wool, and particularly in the domestic medium and lower grade wools that they've really been hit. Um, Canadian sheep have harsh winter conditions that require bedding and feeding, and that is a huge disadvantage um, compared to other wool growing nations. Uh, so because of the requirement that we're bedding and feeding, very clean Canadian wool often has more vegetation in it than average quality New Zealand wool. Uh, Canadian wool must also travel a very long distance for grading and sale. Um, everything that gets sold through CCWG, everything goes, gets trucked from here in Alberta all the way to Ottawa before anyone looks at the wool. Um, and so we are spending a lot or a lot of money is spent basically transporting manure and vegetation across Canada. Um, and anything the producer can do to avoid transporting manure and vegetation across Canada will ultimately improve the value of the good quality wool that you do send um, because there will be less expenses involved with it. And then another challenge is that no matter what wool product we're talking about um, in terms of product development, there is some grant money going towards that um, for new ideas about wool, what wool can be used with. But no matter what product that ends up being, um, it'll always be cheaper to start with cleaner wool. So product innovation won't help the value of your wool clip unless you're starting with clean wool. Um, unless it happens to be a product where vegetation and, man and manure is being incorporated into the product like compost or like uh, wool garden pellets. But anything that requires processing through mechanical equipment, um, I know people have been looking at different environmental options for um, like erosion control or oil wicking, those things, it's always gonna be better to to start with the cleanest wool that you can get as a processor. But there are some definite opportunities for wool in Canada. Um, we do have a vibrant small scale wool processing industry. So there are three small industrial mills in Canada, our mill, and then two in Eastern Canada. And there are many, many um, what are called mini mills, which are cottage industry sized mills in Canada. And they are processing wool every day for um, farms to do direct marketing. And that is something that even the big wool nations don't have. We get calls here at Custom Woolen Mills from people from Australia, people from um, Ireland and the UK saying like, geez, I wish we had an option. Like how do we get a mill of your size started in our area so that we can improve the value of our wool. Um, so I think that's a lucky thing for us that we have these mills happening. 
Um, I think that there is an increasing market for naturally colored wool. So the grays, browns, natural blacks, um, it's something that we are short on constantly. We're always letting people know that we're looking for it. And I think it's a market that'll grow because it's environmentally friendly. All the products that we make with natural gray and black fibers don't require um, dyeing. And so that's a whole slew of synthetic chemicals that we don't have to use. And there is a growing body of um, consumers that that is really important to them. They're very interested in environmentally friendly products. And so, and colored wool is so hard to come by. Um, so if the Canadian, if Canadian producers can produce more colored wool, there is a definite market for it. Um, there is an emerging market in wool garden pellets. Um, and I think that this is an excellent way to use wool that's more contaminated with vegetation because um, the process of pelletizing minimizes the risk of seeds contaminating other environments that might be traveling in the wool. And it gets waste wool or contaminated wool um, processed and out the door quickly. Um, when it comes to highly contaminated wool, the key to cost recovery is to handle it as little as possible and to move it as quickly as possible. Um, so those are some opportunities that I think can be worked on. Uh, some quick marketing strategies for small farms. Um, I know when it comes to shearing and basically every part of your operation, as you get set up, um, it, it's expensive. Like every little bit you add, it's, it's a huge um, expense if you're only dividing it by 100 ewes. Um, and I know that the shearing, it, you're not probably not gonna get the premium price of $6 a U or whatever, um, if you've only got a few to deal with. And so that's where you can try to use direct marketing to your advantage. Um, so you can, if you're taking careful care of your fleeces, there's opportunities to sell it raw into the craft market. Um, if you are already involved in direct marketing of your lamb uh, to consumers, then custom processing of wool into finished products is a natural go along with that if you already have a customer base that you're accessing. Um, to make this work, you do have to know your local market and what who you're going to be dealing with. If you're going to be dealing with a local quilting um, group or if you're mostly, you know, if you're surrounded by knitters or people that do a lot of crocheting, you sometimes have to think about what your market's going to be and tailor your products to them. And you have to work to develop your story in the direct marketing world, I think consumers are really looking to connect personally to um, that farm life and experience. So it takes some more work, but you can uh, access more value out of your wool that way. It's important to realize that processing of wool is tied to the cycles of agriculture. So um, be prepared to plan in advance, at least probably one year. Um, all like I know it's a common complaint among uh, wool producers that when they want to do direct marketing, none of the mills have availability or it's like a six month turnaround or an eight month turnaround or sometimes a two year turnaround. But um, that's not just due to a shortage of mills available to do processing. It's also just the nature of agriculture. So all the shearing happens right now, you know, kind of between December and June, depending on when people and how people are doing their lambing. So all the wool shows up to 
the mill um, now. And so you get, we get this huge influx of fiber in the spring and then we work to try to get it done. Everybody wants it done for Christmas and eventually that just doesn't happen. Um, and then we have a quieter time when the shearing's done, the winter season is over, and then we get a huge influx of wool again. So I think that even when new mills open up um, pretty quickly, you know, one spring happens, they've got, and they've got all the wool that they're gonna process for the next year. And it kind of has to be that way also for them to keep processing or for us to keep processing year round. Um, if we didn't have that influx, if we were able to process everybody's fiber as soon as it arrived to us or within three weeks of it arriving to us, once shearing season was done and all the wool had come in, we'd be out of work for the next six months. And uh, that would kind of be the end of our situation. And that would certainly be kind of where it stops for small, small mills. So that agricultural cycle is just kind of a part of small direct marketing mills. For large producers, there aren't really many mills that can handle direct marketing options for um, when you get into 800 U's or more, or even 100 U's and more, there's more limited options. Um, so there you really have to capitalize on economies of scale. Your wool price is naturally going to be tied to the international market because it's not all gonna get used here in Canada. And if you're planning to sell into the domestic market, so if you wanna to sell to our mill or one of the mills out east, you do need to put in the extra work to develop ongoing relationships. Um, speaking about sorting, speaking about clean wool, you know, if we get an unsorted batch of wool in, it can really, if we did that too often, it would sink us. So um, you have to be prepared to make sure you developed relationships where the mill trusts that what they're gonna get from you is something that they can use. Um, and in terms of direct marketing strategies, it's a lot of legwork and planning. Um, and while it's an, option you have to be planning way in advance so expect two years of planning and product development with some of our bigger producers that we do custom processing for um, we can normally get into a pretty good routine with them after a year or two where they're dropping off their new clip at the same time that they're picking up their last run of products so we with a bit of work, we can get into a one-year rotation, but it takes us a full year to slot in all their different products um, so that it's ready for pickup at one time. So just be prepared to do a lot more planning. And that brings us to the end of my uh, presentation. Um, I wanted to list a few resources that I think are really excellent um, that you can look to if you want to think about uh, wool value. Um, one that we look to all the time here at the mill is called the Fleece and Fiber Source Book. Um, and they have a smaller version called the Field Guide to Fleece. And that just covers every breed of wool um, or every breed of sheep are the most common ones here in North America and talks about their wool characteristics and their product applications. Um, so it's a great, great thing to reference if you're interested in fleece. Um, the next thing I recommend is definitely ask your shearers their opinion on your setup. They see hundreds of setups a year. They know good wool from, good clean wool from wool that needs work. And uh, they, they are, should definitely be viewed as a resource. If they're coming to your farm, you can ask them, you know, what do you think I need to do to make this work better? Um, Alberta lamb producers, I, they have, thank you very much for having me today. Um, 
but also you have lots of excellent resources and PDFs on your website. So if you are interested in wool, the basics are available um, in terms of information that you need from places like the Alberta Land Producers, from Canadian Cooperative Wool Growers. Um, there, there are uh, text, inf text uh, information available out there. And then lastly, you can give us a call at the mill. Um, we're happy to try to steer you in the right direction um, from our opinion. We're happy to give you our opinion, um, whether you're bringing your wool to us or not. We are incredibly passionate about the Canadian wool uh, environment and market. It's what we exist in 100%. We use all Canadian wool um, and then we sell to Canadian consumers mostly. And so it's really important to us that the Canadian wool industry thrives. Um, and so whatever we can do in terms of helping you as producers to make that happen, we're happy to do that. Um, so if anyone has questions for me, uh, now would be a great time to ask them. If anyone's even there. Hi, Maddie. Hi. Hi, it's Linda Ray. Um, we were talking about the marking pens. Are you talking about the spray or the, the crayons? Is it the spray you don't want or is it the crayons that you don't want? The spray is particularly bad. Okay. Um, the crayons, we also sort that out. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But the, you're, you're talking like RAM crayons? Uh, no, just like for, you know, they sell the, the little crayons, you know, the different colored crayons for marking. So okay. they're, they're like a wax crayon. So those don't wash out well either. No. no, none of the marking, none of the marking uh, things wash out at all. So anything that's colored like that, we take it out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So and, we'll just put them on up top on their neck or head. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. There was a question that came in the chat box, uh, Maddie. It was, um, would you have specific breeds for colored wools that you would consider buying? Sure. Um, so we are not too choosy when it comes to colored wools, as long as it doesn't have hair or Kemp in it. So um, Romanoff crosses that we can't take those because um, they've got so much hair in them. But we are kind of looking for colored wool in all types. So domestic medium, if you had colored dorsets, I know some Rideau Arcot flocks get the odd colored fleece in them. Um, Kalan Forest get the odd colored fleece in them. Where we have markets for both domestic medium type wools in colored wool and fine. So Rambouillet, um, basically anything we can get our hands on, as long as it's clean enough that we can work with it, we're interested in it. And, and actually to add to that too, I'm kind of accumulating a, a list of people I know that have a lot of colored fle fleeces in their flock and who have colored rams. Um, that have nice quality wool. So if you're interested in introducing some colored wool into your flock, I can potentially help connect you to producers that might have rams available. There is another question that came through, but I'm wondering, it's a bit of a longer question, so you might want to read it. Do you want to open up the chat box? Um, I can try. It's just mm -hmm. at the top, there should be an option where it says chat. Mm. If not, I can read it to you too. Sure, maybe read it, sorry. Uh, 
So it's, hi Maddie, thanks for the presentation. I'm wondering about small flocks. We have a small flock of 25 ewes and do a lot of education with schools and communities and I've been asked a lot about using the wool for yarn. We have a Cheviot and a Canadian Arcot mix and I'm also wondering the price-ish to have our fleeces made to yarn. Just wondering if it is even worth it to process. Sure, yeah, um, it definitely is. If you have a market and you, and that's something that you want to do, like if you want to market it um, and you have a direct market consumer base, um, then you can certainly, it can certainly be an excellent product. Um, and, you know, if you're going to schools, there are lots of crafts that you can do that are interactive with kids um, that might use it or, you know, craft kits that you can do with them. Um, that, that might be something you can sell. But uh, we have our custom processing price list listed on our website. So our website is um, information. Uh, with our price list there available for you to download or view. Um, and then I'd be happy to speak with you further about that uh, over the phone or via email to flesh out what might work for you more if that's something you want to pursue. She said, thank you, Maddie. <laughs> Hi, Maddie, it's Linda again. I have another question. Um, do you know producers in Alberta that use coats? Anybody that brings their wool to you that you you like the quality of them and, and that they do use coats and how efficient is that for them to use? Um, I So there isn't anyone that brings product fleeces to us where they've used coats. Almost exclusively when people are using coats, they are direct marketing their raw fleeces to spinners. Okay. Um, if you've got a good setup where you're keeping most of your vegetation out, uh, the coats aren't necessary for our style of processing. Like you really don't see too much benefit um, compared to the effort of putting coats on. Because mm -hmm. I think you do have to change the size of the coat as the sheep, as the fleece grows. Mm -hmm. So the coats are almost exclusively used for marketing raw fleeces to the hand spinning market. Okay. And there, I think they do find value in it um, because depending on the fleece that you have, you can sell it for anywhere from 30 to $150 for the one fleece. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think the coats are a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thanks. No problem. Do we have any other questions for Maddie? Okay, well, I'm not hearing or seeing any other questions coming through. So, Maddie, I would like to thank you very much um, for your presentation tonight and to our participant who joined us this evening. This will conclude our webinar. I will be sending an email to everyone who registered for this evening's session that will include a link to where you can access the webinar recording. Okay, thank you very much, Maddie.